welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. Today's film was The Witch. It's out in theaters now. Craig and I thought we'd go have a look at it and come back to you today and let you know what we thought. Craig, did you read anything about this movie before you went to see it? Really nothing at all. I mean, I kind of had a basic idea of the premise. I knew it was a period piece uh, set in colonial New England and that it dealt with a witch. Yeah. That's about it. That's all I knew. <laughs> and I I had read some kind of... No, I didn't read them. I mean, I saw headlines praising it. Uh, I didn't really see anything. And I didn't read into it because I didn't want to know too much going in. But it seemed like what I was seeing out there was positive response. So I'm yeah. looking forward to it. It, it. The headlines I've been seeing have been almost on the same lines of... It was reminding me a little bit of the reception of the Babadook. Yeah. And uh, it follows. Both of those got these glowing, it's not your typical horror movie right. reviews. And so that made me a little hesitant going in here because I know that both of those films I was a little disappointed in. Were, were you? I Well, you know, especially with... You, yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I think especially with uh, The Babadook, I think the problem was that I had seen so much positive stuff about it that I had really high expectations. Yeah. And I, I thought I thought it was good. I just thought I don't know if it's really worth all the hype. You yeah, know I, mean? I mean it's different enough. And yeah. this movie, so I intentionally, much like you, I guess, I intentionally stayed away from those, thinking that maybe if I don't read too much about it and get too excited about it, uh, it will turn out to you know move me in a way that I've never been moved. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you know it was a uh, I don't know the movie is pretty. Slow. If I had one fault, I would say maybe it was a little too slow. Although I'm not sure that you could do this movie any other way. Extremely slow burn, very depressing. Yeah, really grim from from the beginning on. Yeah. Well, we might as well dive into the plot, I guess. Yeah, and the plot itself is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, you start out, I, I guess, in a Puritan courtroom, town meeting house or whatever, and it appears that this man is being tried or, or sentenced or, or something, and uh, they say that he's a blasphemer or he I, is in... It's very unclear. It's Yeah, it's totally yeah. unclear. And he's defending himself, saying, no, I've never spoken anything but the true word of God. I believe in God. You all have no right to judge me. You're false Christians. Um, yeah, he, he throws it right back at them, basically. Right, right. And uh, when it comes down to it, I guess they basically just say... I don't know. I don't know if they, you know, if he had, was... He almost volunteered that he would be willing to just leave. Yeah. Uh, and they were like, well, okay, if that's what you want to do, go ahead and do it. And so he, they said, you're banished yeah. from the community. Yeah. And so he takes his family. Um, he's got his wife. Okay. So the, the dad's name is William. Um, his wife's name is Catherine. And they've got five kids. Two older kids, Thomas and a daughter, mm -hmm. Caleb, a son. And they seem to be around the same age. Maybe Is Thomas the oldest, you think? It seems like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but close in age. And then there are twins who are younger, I would guess, maybe like eight, something like that. Yeah. And uh, a baby, Samuel. And the twins are uh, Jonas and Mercy. They, I guess, just go and establish their own little farm kind of on the outskirts of town. Like, at one point in the movie, the dad says it's like a day's uh, ride to town. So they're out kind of in the woods on their own, and that's it. I mean, the whole movie focuses on what happens with this family out here on their own. And they're really the only characters that we, well, aside from the witch, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Um, the only characters we really see for the, the whole movie. It seems to set this tone for the film that we're going to be dealing a lot with themes of exile, themes mm -hmm. of being alone, themes of being away from society, outside of society. There's that shot as they're leaving, which is a point of view shot of them. The, the girls are just sitting on the back of this wagon that is slowly leaving out of town. And you see, as they're leaving, they're, they see the streets, and it's just the backs of people uh, walking away from them, walking up the, the hill or whatnot. Some Indians come into view, and mm -hmm. they have Native Americans, and they come, and they're walking you know, up to, and they kind of turn, turn their heads a little bit and watch them, but then keep going on their sense. A, a very visual metaphor for turning their back right. on these, this family as they loan, you know, in a very lonely way go out into the wilderness. And in a sense, I felt that was that put them in a very similar situation as the witch, right? Right. The witch 
turns her back on society and goes out into the woods. And these folks are at that precipice where they set up their homestead, basically, yeah, uh-huh. on the edge of the woods. Right. And it's like right at that point between civilization and the, the dark, scary wilderness. Mm-hmm. And they set that up very quickly. Remember with those, there's just this these long shots of the woods yeah. with very ominous music, but nothing going on. Right. Yeah. And it sets up, you know, the idea that they're isolated. They're on their own. So any problems that they encounter, they only have themselves to rely on. You know, there's there's really no help. Like I said, the, the village is, you know, I guess within reachable distance, but they've been exiled. So they would have to be pretty desperate to seek solace or help from the people who have just banished them. So they're really, uh, it, it's desolate and they're alone. And, and the way that the film is shot even really holds to that tone. Um, I mean, it, it, it feels very puritanical. Everything mm. is really simple, really dark, really, uh, you know, all the colors are, are, you know, there's no bright colors. Everything's no. drab. And I read uh, that they tried to make as much use of natural lighting as possible and tried not to use uh, much artificial light when, when possible. And you can tell because it's, it's, it's not one of those movies that's so dark that you can't see what's going on, but it's always in shades of darkness, or seems like it. Yeah, it's a very bleak, depressing movie from the get-go, and the pacing helps with that, and as you said, the color helps with that. I don't know, I'm always convinced that camping is one of those things that everybody says they love, uh-huh. but nobody really actually enjoys, or right. at least you do that night when you're around the campfire telling stories, and then when you actually have to sleep and wake right. up in the morning, you just feel gross, you know? You are you smell like smoke, and you, you're you not comfortable because you were sleeping in a sleeping bag on the ground, and it's been cold, right. and you can't wash up, and it's just nasty, and that feeling is the feeling I got watching this movie, you know? Oh, yeah. This I mean, people's existence. Right. It doesn't make you wish that you lived in colonial New England. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they have to completely provide for themselves. You know, if they can't, then they're just screwed. <laughs> and it seems like uh, they're trying to farm corn. Eventually we find out that's not going very well. But really, we for a movie that really is pretty slow-paced, we jump into the main conflict right away. We do. They arrive where they're going to set it up. They all kneel and pray, kind of, and you see the woods looming in the background in this clear and then we jump a little bit forward in time to where they've built a, a house and they've kind of got some stuff, you know, their goat pen set up and whatnot. And the mom, um, Catherine, hands the baby Samuel to Thomason, the oldest daughter, for her to watch the baby while the parents are working. And Thomason takes the baby just kind of over to the side of the house and she lays him down on the ground and she's playing peekaboo with him. And it's a cute little fat baby and he's laughing and stuff. And I actually, I had seen the trailer. So this was the one scene that I had seen. Um, She's playing peekaboo with the baby and of course, you know, she covers her eyes and she uh, takes her hands away and the baby's there. Boo! (laughs) <laughs> where is Sam? Where is Sam? Where is that little man? Peep boo! <laughs> there you are. There you are. Peep boo! The last time she does it, we see the look on her face and then it shoots back down to where the baby was but the baby's gone yeah there's no natural explanation for what could have happened i mean she's she only had her hands on over her eyes for a couple of seconds and they're in a clearing it's not like there could have been somebody really nearby concealed that could have gotten the baby so it's got to be something weird yeah and then i was thinking okay so this is going to be the mystery Mm. But it wasn't. I mean, it cuts right away. You see this shrouded figure running through the forest, um, and you hear the baby crying. And then, I mean, we get a full-out witch scene. You do. And that's what really struck me about this film, is it is absolutely on its face what it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, It wears its intentions on its sleeve. It plays it straight the whole way through. I was always waiting, as you kind of alluded to there a second ago, for this mystery or this M. Night Shyamalan twist right. kind of thing happening. And, you know, spoiler alert, this is a movie about which a witch and what it does to this family. Right. I mean, the direction that they go is that this is actually set, I think, about... 
30, 50 years, something before the Salem witch trials, um, but around the time that the first kind of witch scare happened uh, mm-hmm. in New England. Um, and, you know, the approach the movie takes is it's real. It's not just paranoia. It's not just kids pretending, you know, there really are witches. I mean, obviously the family has to process through their minds. You know, they don't immediately jump to witchcraft, even though that is something that they clearly believe in and it's a possibility, Mm -hmm. but they try to explain it away practically first. You know, their, their thought is it had to have been a wolf, you know, or, or some animal. We know that that doesn't make any sense, but that would be, you know, my first thought wouldn't be, oh, well, witches, obviously. Yeah. Um, but as it turns out, it is witches, um, or a witch, at least, a that witch. we see. It's odd because it does leave, the movie, in a good way, uh, leaves a little bit unclear as to, okay, well, maybe it's a witch. Is it? Is there supernatural stuff mm-hmm. going on, though? Is some of this in their mind? Is right. some of it dreamy? It's very clear that the woman has taken the baby because, as you said, we see a scene, the very next thing is this baby laying down and the woman's hand, kind of in the shadows, caresses it and then takes a knife. Mm-hmm. And I thought maybe she was going to castrate it, but it seems like actually killed the baby mm-hmm. because it, she's smearing the blood and, and guts kind of over her. Uh, again, we don't get a good look at her, but we see her older, saggy kind right, of She's body. nude. I mean, it's it's kind of your, I don't know, you know, there's lots of different versions of witches, but this is when I think of traditional coven witches, yeah. you know, like Mac, the Macbeth witches, you know, <laughs> right, like right. Uh, old, you haggy, know, haggy, prone. right, naked. Like uh, witching and bitching, you know, yeah, we saw yeah, in the, right. the big old one at the end, is right, sort of a caricature right. of that. An old lady, old hat, and she's she's nude, and babies in peril is a lot like dogs in peril. Like you know, you're like, no, not the baby. Um, and and they don't show anything terribly graphic, but no. it's it's clear. I mean, she puts the knife towards the child, and then you see her, and this is all shot so that you're not getting a direct look. You're kind of seeing her from behind or from the side in profile. The light, the light is low and it's just lit by kind of flickering firelight. But you do see that where the baby was laying is now there's blood and gore there and she's like bathing herself in, in the blood. So it appears that she sacrificed the baby and they, you know, the family looks for a few days um, but then they just have to give up. You know, there's, they don't know what to do. Yeah, and the mother is just beside herself. She, uh, Catherine, right? Mm-hmm. She has not slept, as the father says. What's his name again? William. As William says, she hasn't slept in days ever since it happened. And, and she, she's been constantly praying to herself. I mean, these people are supremely religious. Yes. I mean, they are they are true Puritans. You know, mm-hmm. you know um, they're constantly praying. They're constantly. The, the daughter uh, at one point in the beginning says, "I know that I deserve eternal hellfire. I've broken every commandment in thought, but please have mercy on me." It's that very puritanical, self loathing kind of thing. Which is a very arresting scene because this 11, 12 year old girl. You're thinking, what in the world has she done? Could right. she possibly have done to flagellate? herself right. in this vicious sort of way, verbally. Right. And she's cute, and she's nice, and she's generally pretty sweet, and she's very responsible. Mm-hmm. Right? They ha- all have to be responsible mm-hmm. in order to make this existence go, and that was another thing that really struck me about this movie was it takes its time showing you just how miserable a lifestyle yeah. this is. When you are out on your own homesteading at this time and this period... All you have really is the luck of the draw Mm -hmm. and faith to turn on. And these people's faith is failing them Mm -hmm. 100% all the time. But they cling to it even more fervently because it's all that they have. Right. The corn is going bad and it's rough and dirty and miserable and they have to carry the water from the creek. It's just exhausting watching it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, obviously this is fiction. They There's a on-screen text at the end that says that this was based on uh, actual historical court documents and some of the uh, lines from the movie are actually recorded in, in court documents and whatnot, which I feel like is to, you know, be like, ooh, it's based on a true story. But it, it's really not all that surprising. I mean, yeah. th- though it is fiction, I feel like it's it's pretty true to what, colonial Puritan life was like. I mean, it was hard. And they did strongly believe in the forces of evil. They 
literally believed that the forest was a wicked place where the black man, the the devil, uh, prowled around and had a book that you know would he would force you to sign your name and then he would have your soul. They believed in uh, in witchcraft and and of course you know I think that that was the reasoning for that was to keep order in their society. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, like you said. Very unpleasant. I mean, (laughs) just even, you know, feeling the mother, when the baby dies, she's inconsolable and she feels that maybe they're being punished for whatever crime they were accused of back in the village. Which lays on the guilt. Right. Especially the guilt on Thomason. Of course, she feels guilty and you can see it in her face. Well, and it seems like... (sighs) As as rebellious as a young Puritan could be, I feel like like Thomason just maybe has a little bit she's of an, the one. she has like a, she has like a little independent streak, and so it seems like maybe she's kind of been a nuisance for her parents in the past, especially the mom. There seems to be some tension between Thomason and the mom. Then, I mean, Thomason was the one who had the baby when it went missing. So I think the mom's got a little bit of blame going on there too, and it seeps out a little bit, so there's tension between them. There's tension abounding because they are on the verge. I mean, they're doing okay in the moment, but the winter is approaching. They don't have enough store of food, um, and so uh, though they have tried to avoid the forest because of their beliefs about the forest, the dad secretly takes Caleb out into the forest um, to set traps. That's right. And they keep that, and and he asks the son, Caleb, to keep that a secret from the mother. So then there's secrecy and Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of stuff going on. It's one thing piling on top of another. And he does take him out there, and they've set these traps. In the meantime, later on, we get a very pivotal scene with Thomason and Caleb sitting by the edge of the brook. And again... That's what this movie really does. I I can't say it's subtlety, but it's a quiet sort of visual language Mm -hmm. where Thomason is washing clothes. Mm -hmm. And this may even be the second time in this film. Yeah, when Caleb is looking at her and he's looking at her cleavage. She's got almost no cleavage, but she's She's like a 12-year-old girl. Right, But she's blossoming and he's taking some interest. And so you have this... Again, it's it's more of this sadness of this isolation that exactly. this boy's got to look at his sister when he's getting these feelings that he's at this age. And you know she's got to be if she's not already you right. know, at that age. Well, and it's the isolation, but it's also when you live that life that where you repress every, you know, natural desire, yes. <laughs> um, it's bound, I mean, especially in adolescence, it's bound to spill out somewhere, and as yucky as it sounds, I mean, if your sister is the only young female around, it, yeah. it, she's going to maybe draw your eye. But the movie doesn't really pound you over the head with this. No, it's, and no. It's very subtle, yeah, it's, again, more of that tension. Now you have the tension of these kids growing up, and they're at these pivotal points in their lives when their emotions and... And you're also fighting hormones and things like that. And the two little kids, what were their names again? Uh, The boy is Jonas and the girl is Mercy. Mm -hmm. Jonas and Mercy are almost like way too cute. And they run around in their bonnets and and they are, get to be kids. They yeah. just play around, and they run around. They run around with the the ram, the the goat, the goat. Uh, Black Philip. They, I, I guess it's, you know, these goats are obviously for their agricultural purposes. They, <laughs> you know, they they harvest their milk and whatnot. But it seems like Black Philip is kind of the kid's pet goat. Yeah, uh, and they play around with him and sing songs and like talk to him and stuff. <laughs> Get back! You can stop that! Um, and it is, it is cute. But uh, at that scene by the river or creek or whatever it is where she's washing clothes, Caleb is upset just because of everything that's going on. You know, like you said, it's just one thing after another. Mm-hmm. And she comforts him, and it's sweet. It's not yucky. I mean, it's, it's, not weird it's at all. no, it's it's just sweet brother sister. But then they hear something, like a twig snap or something, and they get up, and I'm thinking maybe the witch is hanging around yeah. or something, but it, it it turns out it's Mercy, but uh, she's got, like, a stick that she's, like, pretending to use as a broom, and she's saying, I'm the witch of the woods, and I'm going to get you, and she's, I guess, 
teasing or kind of picking on Thomason. So then Thomason turns it around on her and says, no, I'm the Witch of the Woods, and I uh, took Samuel, and at night my spirit comes out of my body and dances naked in the woods with the devil. And, and I signed his book. And right, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to eat you or something along those lines. I mean, she's lying, but... She's the, the, terrifying little Yeah, mercy. she's terrifying the little girl, and I was thinking... This is dangerous. And it would have been very dangerous in yes. their society to even pretend that, you Especially know, because... Especially with the young child. Yeah, and they were... The Puritan community in general was so paranoid. It did not take very much for them to, you know, for suspicion to rear its ugly head. So I knew. I was like, oh, you really don't want to be doing that. <laughs> <clears throat> and she didn't. Right. <laughs> it really was a bad call. I mean, we've all seen The Crucible, right? Mm-hmm. So we know how that, how that, t- that thing goes. Well, th- the mom and the dad are talking about they're in bed. It's like a one-room house, but the mom and the dad kind of have curtains around their their bed. When and they're they down, they're down below, and the kids sleep in the loft, like up above. Right. And uh, they're talking about the immediate future and what they're going to do. And the mom calls and to see if the kids are awake. And because they don't respond, she assumes that they're asleep, but they're not. They're right. sitting up listening. And she says. She's getting, I think she's getting uncomfortable because Thomason is developing. She is becoming a woman. And not only do they need money, but it was also traditional for when young women became young women for them to go out and to work as a servant in another household um, until they would be married and then they would go to their husband's household. Mm. And so uh, the kids hear that that's the plan, that the parents are going to, the dad's going to take her into town and um, find a family for her to live in, with and, and work for. Um, and she doesn't want to go. And then I, so I, I guess maybe Caleb doesn't want her to go either. It seems like it's his, he's trying to protect her, trying to get some. Again, trying to improve the family situation all on his own so that she doesn't have to leave. Mm -hmm. So he decides to go off and tries to go off in the middle of the night, essentially, with the horse. And Thomason comes out and sees what he's doing and says, you can't go that, you can't go into the woods. And he says, no, I I need to do this for us. Eventually, she convinces him to take her with him. Mm -hmm. So they go into the woods and the woods are pretty creepy. Yeah. Every time the woods are shown in this movie, it's it really is the unknown, it's the scary, it's the lack of it's the wild essentially. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's also the dead and the cold. Yeah. They're not even it doesn't seem to be teeming with wildlife. At least no. it's not helping these folks out any and we're not seeing it. Except we do every now and then see this rabbit. Yeah, this weird rabbit. Like the first time that uh the dad and Caleb went out. They saw this rabbit, and the dad tried to shoot it, but it's his gun backfired in his face. And then I feel like Thomason... I don't remember if this is, you know, in the correct timeline, but at some point, Thomason sees the rabbit in the goat pen. That's right. Um, and when they go out, when Thomason and Caleb are out this time, he finds something in one of the traps that they had set, so they're happy about that. Uh, but then the dog... As it did the first time when he was out with his dad, the da- the dog starts barking and they see that he's barking at this rabbit. And so the dog takes off after the rabbit. Caleb takes off after the dog. And the horse even rears back at the rabbit. Right, right. And uh, Thomason is on the horse and she's thrown from the horse and is knocked unconscious on the ground. And I guess the horse takes off? Is that... Yeah. That's mm-hmm. basically what happened, yeah. Yeah. And so I guess... The night passes. I mean, I I think that Caleb kind of gets lost in the woods by himself looking for the dog. Thomason is knocked out. So the, when the parents wake up in the morning, they, they see that they're gone, and the horse is gone, and the gun is gone, and the dog is gone. So they kind of go out into, you know, as far into the woods as they dare, kind of calling and whatnot. Um, meanwhile, Thomas hears the dog, um, Fowler the dog, whimpering. And he comes upon him, and the dog has been... It's still alive, unfortunately, but it's, he's, it looked like it had been gutted. Yeah. Uh, and so Thomas continues looking around until he comes upon this little cottage. This is Caleb, by the way. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Caleb. Until he comes uh, across this cottage in the woods. You know, it looks like... The classic cottage in the woods. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, it's kind of earthen, and kind of seems like it's maybe kind of built into a hill or something, and there's just smoke coming out of the, the chimney. And, of course, you're thinking... Get away from there. <laughs> what? It, it might as well have been made of candy. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. 
And he approaches the door, and um, the door opens, and out steps this beautiful woman in a low-cut, revealing thing that shows her bosom. And I liked this scene because it felt like Caleb was being seduced, you know, just both visually, but also that there was some sort of otherworldliness about some it. Some kind of supernatural aspect. Right. And I, the reason that I liked it was because the, the kid who played uh, Caleb, on his face, I mean, you could tell he was being drawn towards this woman, but on his face, you could almost tell that he knew that it was bad and that he was in trouble, uh-huh. that this wasn't Going a good well. thing. Yeah. And so she, he approaches her, and she leans in and kisses him on the mouth. And when she kisses him on the mouth, then her arm reaches around and grabs the back of his head very forcefully, and the arm is the arm of an old hag. Yeah, that was a really effective scare, I yeah, felt. Yeah, it was creepy. Uh, it was extremely creepy. And again, in a movie that doesn't have much for jump scares, mm-hmm. I would I would consider that one. Although, it's not your traditional jump scare. Right. It's a little more subtle. Yeah. The music comes to a hit, and yeah, I uh, I also thought that that was an effective scene, and it really is emblematic of a lot of this film in that the camera lingers on people and their faces mm-hmm. for almost too long sometimes, mm-hmm. to that point where it starts to feel uncomfortable. It, well, and it feels unnatural. Yeah. And I, I think that that is effective. And it gets you wondering in your head, what are they thinking? Mm-hmm. Uh, I especially got this feeling a lot when the camera would linger on Thomason. Even at that moment where you talked about toward the beginning of the movie where she's playing peekaboo with the baby and her she does that last peekaboo and it's from the baby's perspective. Mm-hmm. We see her face and there's that look of shock, there's that look of surprise, but it lingers for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And it gets you really analyzing her emotional state. Yeah. More than you normally would. You know, if I were doing, if I were cutting that scene, I absolutely would have cut away. It would have been a quick sh- yeah. look of shock. It would have been a quick thing. But I think this is more effective in that way. It really pulls us into the minds of the characters. It forces us to to ask what they're thinking, and it forces us to second guess sometimes yeah. the things that they're saying because there are so many secrets, and because we're still wondering if there isn't something more here exactly. uh, that meets the eye. That was a great. That was a great scene. We know that he's pretty much done for, and at the meantime, uh, Tom- Thomason has found her way out of the woods back to the family. Mm-hmm. Well, they they all go in the house, and at this point, you know, again, like it's not set out right, but just through the tension between characters, you can tell that they've not failed to notice that Thomason has been present when both of these people have disappeared. Yeah, and so. Even though it's it's not in your face, you know that they're starting to question and, and that maybe she is going to kind of be at the center of some of those questions. Uh, the dad, William, wants to go out and look for him uh, in the night. And, and the mom says that she doesn't want him to go out. It's uh, She wants him to go into town for help, but he doesn't have a horse. He doesn't have a gun. He doesn't have a dog. It's raining. Yeah, they took all that. Yeah, and uh, I, I think that... I don't know if she convinces him not to go. I don't remember how that played out. Oh, that's right. But you did, no, he doesn't end up going. But what happens is that uh, I think it's Th- Thomason who's outside wandering around. Or she, she, goes, she goes out, out to, to feed the... To, yeah, to bed down the goats. They have to bed down the goats. That's night. right. And there's Caleb standing there naked mm-hmm. uh, by the post in the rain. And he collapses. And right. she takes him in. They take him up to the attic. And he's babbling he's at first he's kind of catatonic mm-hmm. but then the next morning he they're all outside working i mean that, that's the other thing too like <laughs> life can't stop that's you know right. like they have to keep working um so they're all outside working and uh they hear a, a scream from inside and it's caleb and he has kind of a fit <laughs> What does this to me? What does this? His mouth is sealed up. Mm. Oh, God. Will you? Will you? Mm. Mm. Hold it. Children, away from this. Thomas, say now. Mm. Mm. He'll break his jaws. 
I, I hadn't oh, no. noticed this when he was outside, but he's got um, oh, what looked like scratches uh, all over his body. Oh, yeah. And speaking of that, again, another bit that is real subtle, but just shows you how bleak and sad things are. Just in case you need a reminder, is when they're first looming over him as he is catatonic and they're patting him down and they're doing all that they can, they cut a little bit of his, uh, around his eye and uh-huh. start to bleed him out. Yeah. You I, know, it's, it's old medicine. I know. That's, you know? see, I don't know anything about that, but that's what I thought. I was like, so I guess you bleed a fever. Yeah. You know, I it's mean, weird. The, the, there's the, something bad in the blood. And so you bleed right. the ba- blood out and you're thinking, man, this kid has no chance. He has no chance out in the woods. He's got right. no chance with his family at home. <laughs> So he screams, and they go in, and like, I don't know, I mean, first of all, they all have really, really thick New England accents. Yes. Really thick. And there were times when I really struggled to understand what they were saying, and there were some times when I didn't understand what they were saying. And it wasn't just the accent, but it was also the dialect. Right. The the phrases that they're using and everything, when when you're already having a hard time making out what they're saying... And then you, the words and sentences are so unnatural right. to our present day, compounded on the fact that everything's spoken at really low tones mm-hmm. and they're almost whispering to each other half the time or, you know, it's kind of down deep in their throat when they're talking mm-hmm. because it's so quiet. My gosh, man, I'd say about half the dialogue in this movie went like, <laughs> right over my head. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't the only one. And, like, it sounded really authentic, but... If you can't understand what they're saying, yeah, like, I don't right. know. Anyway. Oh, I, will, I almost wondered, though, if you could watch this film without, with the sound turned off and still completely understand I it. I think you could, mm-hmm. for the most part. I mean, you might not get some of the nuances, but I think that just the, the energy of what's going on in each of the scenes kind of speaks for itself. Yeah. He kind of has this fit, and then he his his jaw locks, and he starts bleeding from the mouth. And they they try to like pry his his mouth open so that they can put like a stick or a cork in there. They eventually do pry his mouth open, or or he goes limp or something, and he coughs up what looked like a crab apple. Yeah, or, it was like or something. a whole crab apple. Yeah. Now was that something he vomited, or was that something that was always in his mouth? They didn't. No, I couldn't it couldn't tell. have fit in his mouth. No, I don't think so. He retched. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I wondered if that was supposed to be something somewhat supernatural, or if that was just. Uh, well, it's it had an effect. The the mom said oh, he's witched. Like. I don't know if that's some sort of Maybe specific lore. Right, uh, I don't know. It could be. Um, but at that point, she knows he's witched. And now the little kids say, it's her, and point at Thomason. And tell the parents what Thomason said. And now she's in trouble. <laughs> yeah, now she's in trouble. And they even go into this, again, it's, it's so much like the Crucible, you know? They go exactly. into these these fits themselves. The, the kids start almost speaking in tongues and twitching and and they and, can't pray they can't pray like their prayer has been stopped or something like that and and you're thinking oh is this a psychosomatic kind of deal or is this actual supernatural stuff going on and i still don't know i don't either i, I couldn't figure that out because you know with the i i teach literature and so i have i've taught the crucible and so i've looked into the witchcraft trials and whatnot that's why you know so much i'm like oh, okay this guy, this guy knows way too much about puritanical times <laughs> so it, w- during the witchcraft trials the uh, a lot of the behavior remains unexplained but it's you know a common theory that these girls were just pretending and once one of them started pretending then the others would just follow suit so Mm -hmm. it would seem like they all had similar symptoms Mm -hmm. um, which would then be convincing because it was happening to lots of people not just one but here I didn't know I thought there must be something happening because how would they know to do that yeah that's true they're they're isolated here and they of course they're of an age they probably heard enough stories I suppose but yeah I think perhaps the film is deliberately vague on that point yeah and they, like you said they almost kind of i mean they kind of fall to the ground and are twitching a little bit you know they they are, they clearly seem to be affected and the parents at the mother turns on thomas and pretty pretty immediately she does and the father but he rides that fence right uh he he approaches her and and says you know 
tell me the truth, confess, you know, uh, I think he says something like people can be unwitched or something like yeah. that, but you have to tell the truth. It takes her outside. Well, she runs away crying and, uh, he follows her and it seems that he wants to comfort her. And I think that he does. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, he still is suspicious. And I, I think genuinely believes that she's a witch and he starts getting a little bit aggressive with her And keeps saying, tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. And she says, oh, you want to hear the truth? Well, the truth is, (laughs) it's your fault we're out here. It's your fault we don't have any food. It's your fault you can't do anything right except cut wood. Um, Yeah, you can't hunt, you can't grow. All All you can do is cut wood. (laughs) <laughs> Which, again, you is, know, she's a teenager. She is being falsely accused, but maybe not the wisest time <laughs> <laughs> to, to air this laundry. It's a good point. Um, well, so, emotions are high. <laughs> yeah. And I think that just further convinces him that she's wicked. But she says, it's not me. It's the twins. The twins talk to that goat and they say that goat tells them what to do. And the kids have said that yeah. several times that they talk to the goat and Black Philip told us this and Black Philip told us we can do whatever we want and Black Philip said this and this. That was a real clever thing for her to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously out of desperation, but boy did she turn the tables real quick. Right. And so he takes her at her word uh, and goes inside and starts yelling at the kids who are still catatonic or whatever, telling them to confess, to wake up, to stop pretending. He says, I won't be made a fool of by children's games. And eventually, I think he says, I'll sacrifice these children like Abraham. Is Abraham yeah. the one that had to sacrifice his son? Yeah, or yeah, like Abraham did, yeah. And uh, so. he picks up the little boy by, like, his... Sure. Scruff of his neck. Yeah. He is terrified. And and the little boy <laughs> screams. So again, I didn't know if they were pretending, like if, yeah. they, if they were just so scared that they wanted to just kind of pretend like they didn't know what was going on. Because he wakes up then, and at that point, then the dad is suspicious of all of them. Yes. Um, the mother wants Thomason out of the house. The, so the dad takes all of the kids. All three of them, yeah. Yeah. Because Caleb dies. He died. We forgot to say yeah. that. It's it's And it was a weird thing, too. It's a too. very odd situation. He has a very dramatic death that would have seemed laughable <laughs> in another film. Mm-hmm. It's a very Shakespearean sort of death mm-hmm. where he wakes up and he starts praying to God and saying, Oh, Lord, take me. I'm ready to join you up above in... This very flowery language, very mm-hmm. adult flowery language. Well, it's like, I feel your embrace, I feel your kisses. Mm-hmm. It seems like what's happening is he is meeting his maker. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's really odd, but it works in this movie because mm-hmm. everybody's talking like this. Right. You know, and so you can see it and he dies. So then the dad locks the kids up, uh, the rest of the kids up in the pen with the goat. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's got them all boarded up in there. And, uh, that's when the girl and the other kids start chatting and mm-hmm. she's like did you real do, do you really talk to him and they don't really answer do mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. Uh, they she asks them are you witches and they don't really answer no the girl mercy says are you and she says no i'm not and she has said throughout i loved caleb i would never do anything or, is that his name yeah yeah i loved caleb i would never do anything to hurt him and i would never do anything to hurt you and I didn't get the sense that really they were at least consciously involved with anything mm-hmm. supernatural. I got more that they were just confused and didn't really know what was happening. Yeah, that's what I felt too. Um, but they are in there. The mom and the dad are asleep in their room, which I thought was kind of funny. Like, they just go to bed. <laughs> the kids are locked out in the in the goat pen. We'll but, deal with this in the morning. Right. <laughs> we got enough um, chores to do. We see the mother very quickly quietly get out of bed and there had been some business earlier on about how the dad had had to sell her father's silver goblet and she was really upset about that um and you notice that kind of in the background of this scene the goblet is there and then she turns around and caleb is there sitting and holding samuel the baby and she goes over and she is quiet, but she says, I'm so happy to see you. Let me wake your father. He'll be, he'll be so happy to see you. And they say, no, let it. Caleb says, no, let him sleep. And then I think we cut back to the kids in the pen. Yeah, right? and they're hearing stuff happen outside. It sounds like something's landed on the top of the pen and then jumps down onto the ground. Right. And then we cut back to the mom who is now holding the baby. And Caleb is saying something like, 
I'm glad you're glad to see me. I've brought you a book. Will you look at it with oh, me? Oh, that's right. You know what? I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't interpret what he was saying. Yeah. I'm glad you did for yeah. me. He's, I've brought you a book. Will you look at the book with me? And she says, yes, but wait, the baby's hungry. And so she goes to breastfeed the baby. We cut back out to the pen. The little kids are up and are kind of inching towards, I don't know, towards something. And I think that they say Papa or something like that. And then we see what they are seeing, and it is the naked hag, which, I mean, we just see her backside, and it looked like she was maybe suckling the goat or eating the goat, something like that. I thought maybe she was taking the milk from the goat, but she could very well have been eating it. Right. Actually, maybe she was eating it, because in the morning, everything's kind of destroyed. Right. Um, So... She, you know, they see her and they're just kind of standing there watching in awe and her back is turned. And then all of a sudden it closes up to her head and she turns and like laughs, right? Yeah. This really wicked witchy laugh. And then it cuts back to the mother and it's just like a full screen shot of her sitting in a rocking chair with a raven right in front of her eating at her breast, like like pecking, pecking at, at her breast. Yeah, so she felt like she, you know, we had left her. She was breastfeeding Samuel, but we see what's really happening is this raven is pecking at it. And that's the point at which you realize, all right, either we're seeing this crazy dream sequence and all kinds of strange things are happening, or this is supernatural. Yeah. And that was the point where I I bought into the supernatural thing pretty whole hog. Yeah, I, I had pretty much bought into it before that just because I didn't really see any alternative. Mm. You know, like... I, like you said in the beginning i was thinking well maybe it's going to be misunderstanding or 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 there's some practical explanation but um no i mean it's it's witches it's it witchcraft absolutely is and then it, so it cuts to the next morning yep the next morning and father gets up and he steps over um catherine and uh he doesn't notice her bloody so we know that that's true mm-hmm. that's the point where we know okay that actually did happen because her. over her left breast is bloody right and he walks outside, and the pen is burst open, mm-hmm. and all the animals the are, s- are slain. slain over there. And who's who's the only one around? But again, Thomason, mm-hmm. and the boy, even the kids are They're not gone. there. They're gone, and uh, so that's when they have it out. Uh, well, the dad says something like he yells at or something accusatory, or where are they, or something mm-hmm. like that. And then we don't see what happens. But he gets all of a sudden, like, just hit really hard. And you're not clear what has happened immediately, but then it pulls back a little bit, and you see that he has been gored through his gut and torso by Black Phillip. And and not just a little bit, no. <laughs> like, blood is, is coming a out of his wound. mouth. Yeah. That was super surprising. Mm-hmm. Uh, Black Phillip's in on it, too, after all, you know? Mm-hmm. And the dad almost seems to give up. He picks up an axe, and he looks to the heavens, and you see blood drip out of his mouth, and he looks back at the axe, and he tosses it down. And what does he ask? A prayer? Maybe he well, says Black a Phillip prayer. butts him again and knocks him into the wood pile, and the wood kind of falls yeah, down that's around That's what him. he does. And he says... I think what he says is, corruption, I am thy father. I think he was talking about her. I think that he still thought... She's a witch. And that she had done all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, So then... Mother comes mm -hmm. out. Mother comes springing out and sees everything that's happened. Which is interesting. I guess Black Phillip went off to chew on some grass. Right. At that point, Mother comes out and starts attacking Thomason. Mm -hmm. And they have a tussle on the ground. And uh, Thomason, in the midst of the tussle, grabs a... I guess it's a, a knife spade or, or a spade. knife of some sort, and uh, you know, and self defense kind of whacks mom with it, mm-hmm. and mom gets is super cut on the face and starts to bleed on her, and of course, mother especially now lays into her and starts choking her, and this was a heartbreaking mm-hmm. scene because you can tell that Thomason uh, is being choked and that she does not have to let this go on. Mm-hmm. And she's sitting there and crying and crying. And you can tell that she is consciously making this decision to go ahead and take out mom, which she does with a couple more wax. She really doesn't have any choice. No. I mean, it's it's, it's that or... Or or, die. Right. Yeah. And so she is the last surviving person in this family. And man, that scene was heartbreaking. Now, this is getting close to the end of the movie, and I had no idea where it was going to go from here. Yeah. Um... Right? Yeah, it was getting really close to the end, and I I just couldn't imagine what was going to happen next. 
Thomason goes in the house. She takes off her dress. She's got a shift, like an under dress, like a nightgown on underneath. And she sits down at the table and she lays down her head and sleeps until night. And then at night, she takes a candle and she goes out into the goat shed. Well, Black Philip is like standing outside of the goat shed. Yeah. And she stands and kind of, they kind of look at each other for a little bit. This is kind of a wide shot. Um, and then Black to- Black Philip goes turns inside. and goes inside, it's like, and what? she t- and she follows him in. And I thought maybe this okay, maybe this is a dream sequence of some kind. You know? I had no idea what was going to happen. Yeah. But dude, you, you, this you, was you crazy. <laughs> this was absolutely crazy. From here on, we don't see Black Philip. We just see her. It's like from Black Philip's point uh-huh. of view, her talking to him, and she just sits there in the candlelight in this shed and stares at him for a while, and then asks him. Tell me, what, what is it she says? She says, I conjure you to speak to me like you spoke to the twins or something yes. like that. And there's just silence for a while. She repeats it and there's silence for a while again. And then you hear a voice. Uh-huh. This very low, <sighs> whispery male voice. And again, you, I oh, I didn't know what to think because I, I had thought... If the goat starts talking, that's going to be too much. It's going to get it's going to get into like Evil Dead, Drag Me to Hell yeah, territory. It's going to yeah. be goofy. But because you can't see him, there there's no weird effect and you don't really know what she's seeing. So it's not like some animatronic goat head oh, talking. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant way to frame this mm-hmm. if you're going to do it. And as the the goat continues to talk, Again, out of focus, behind her, suddenly you see some boots go by, and you realize there is a man of some kind in there with her, Mm -hmm. who's walked back around from where the goat is, puts his hand on her shoulder, starts talking about this book that he wants her to sign. He asks asks her first, um, well, that's the very first thing that he says, what do you want? Yes. Oh, God. she says, what can you give me? And he says, do you want... A pretty dress? Do you want to travel the world? Do you want wealth? And she says, yes. <laughs> uh, at this point, of course. <clears throat> she's got nothing else. It's a seduction, and it's played very... It's uncomfortable, but it's played seductively. You know, his voice is very soft and, and masculine and seductive, and like you said, he slowly walks around behind her, and once he... And he's completely in shadow. Very, very dark. Oh, you don't Even, see a face. No. Because we're down on the ground, and you're seeing maybe knees up. Right. And when he does put his hand on her shoulder, eventually, it's a very dark, like, unnaturally dark yeah. uh, uh, hand. I thought maybe it was gloved or something, maybe. but it's really hard to tell. Right. Um, but he says, take off your shift, her, her dress, and it seems like there's a little bit of hesitation, but not very much. Mm-hmm. And uh, she takes it off, and he says, do you see a book before you? And we, it, the camera pans down... And there's the book. And she says, I can't write my name. And he says, I'll guide your hand. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's right out of these puritanical nightmares. Yes. Um, but really so well done. It's funny that she even gets to that point where she doesn't say, okay, yes, oh, Lucifer, oh, Lord, I will sign it. You know, she right. she's hesitant, but he says, I'll guide your hand. Right. Um, man, it's such a good bit. And then she walks out of there, out. We get these long, slow shots of her walking naked into the woods. Followed by Black Phillip right yes. behind her. Nude. Yeah. Uh-huh. Through the woods and up to a full-on witch, uh, witch uh, thing going on yeah, you around see, a bonfire. You, you start, it starts out quietly, but you hear this uh, chanting. I mean, it's obvious, you know, witchy chanting. And it gets progressively louder until you realize that it has to be multiple witches. I mean, up to this point... We've seen the old hag. Well, you think there's one. And, we, well, and we've seen the the beautiful. Cr- the beautiful woman, but I'd assumed they were one and the same, and yeah. that she was just transforming. But now we see this whole coven, and again, I mean, it's straight out of the Crucible or uh, anything else, like, you know, these, these women completely nude, dancing uh, kind of erratically around, chanting, you know, really suggestive, and she slowly approaches, and she's watching, and as she watches... The witches begin to levitate up off the ground around this fire, and it's such a. 
I don't know if beautiful is the right word, but it's such a visually yeah. interesting shot. And they just slowly and gracefully rise to different levels. And you see one of them rising to the very... T- it's shot from low, and she's rising all the way to the top of this tree. And then it comes back to Thomason, um, and we see her kind of from the shoulders up. And based on the perspective of the background, we see that she starts to rise too. And as she starts to rise, she smiles. Cut to black. Yeah. Boy, that puts you in an interesting spot, too, because you're thinking, well, this girl pretty much had no choice. Right. You're also wondering, in a, in a, in a strange sort of way, is she a little better off? <laughs> well, know? I mean, that's the and thing. That's... It's, it's at the, she really does have no choice but to just surrender to it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, what else is there left for her to do? I mean, even if she were to try to go back to the village, there's going to, where's the rest of your family? <laughs> oh, you know, they're all murdered? You're, right. what, what, <laughs> you're the only survivor, huh? So she seems to not have any choice. And at the end, it's like, maybe because she has no choice, she chooses to embrace it. Yeah. And it's weird. I did not expect it to go there. I expected mm. some that she would get away. Maybe there would be a confrontation with the witch. Maybe somehow she would trick or defeat the witch somehow. That's what I was expecting, but no. Um, it's, you know, she's she surrenders to it. I even thought it would be sort of a bleak depression and she would almost do a suicide or, or, or just give up on life and slowly rot away and that maybe what we were seeing for a little while, I thought, well, maybe this is a dream. Maybe this is her own mind coming to terms with what's happened And just like the kids, you know, that there was a psychosis, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, She's so far beaten down uh, mentally that she's conjuring up what she needs to uh, for her mind to come at ease. But I don't think the movie plays it that way. I think it's straight out supernatural. There's too much other stuff going on. Right. And, you know, it was such an unexpected ending. Um, because of how straightforward it was. Right. <laughs> and, and the, what's I, like I said, after we, you know, got out of the theater, I was reading some trivia on it and this movie has gotten a full endorsement from the church of Satan. Oh yeah. yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> Satanists love this movie. Um, they say that it is an accurate portrayal of the satanic arts and, okay. um, uh, uh, they, they're big fans. That's weird because I thought the Church of Satan actually didn't believe in the supernatural. I don't know. And see, maybe it's not uh, what I read was Satanists. Oh, so maybe okay. it's not the official Church of Satan. Oh, I don't okay. Know. It could be. Um, All right. But there there are, are <laughs> Satanists out there who are glad that they're getting a little bit of publicity. Wasn't there a little something in the news, too, about how people were staying away from opening night because the, all the Satanists were going to come out? Oh, uh, maybe I did I hear something was, about that. <laughs> it's so funny. It's almost like a little bit of, uh, of the Crucible all over again. Yeah. But... <laughs> It also it <laughs> adds it time. adds a little element of, of to me it kind of creeps me out that yeah. they would embrace it. <laughs> kind of, it almost makes me feel a little dirty. Like right. <laughs> they're not out there, uh, you know, uh, lining up to see Sauce Twenty Two. <laughs> right. You know, right. So, but this movie. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, that's it. What what did you think? I mean, what's your evaluation? You know, I thought it was awfully slow. And I Mm -hmm. think you have to be in the right mindset. You have to be ready for a slow burn in order to watch this film. Or you will be pretty bored and maybe... Maybe a little impatient. I was awfully tired. Today. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say we're a couple middle-aged guys with nine to five jobs, and so we, uh, you know, we're we're you know kind of early bird special kind of folks. So we went to. Um, Todd... No, no, we're not like sixty-five. <laughs> uh, Todd, Sorry, Mom. Todd snuck out of uh, work a little bit early, um, and he and his wife had been up late the night before working, and oh, there geez. were several times when I was pretty convinced you were, you were asleep. No, I swear to you, I didn't sleep at all. But but uh, only because I had something in my contact. <laughs> I was so uncomfortable the whole time blinking, I couldn't have possibly fallen asleep. Well, yeah, we went to a 4.30 matinee. We're the only two people in there. <laughs> we were the only in the theater. <laughs> We had the run of the of the show. Right. It's just not a good uh, not a good place to go if you if you're trying to stay away. Right, but um, but I yeah. I agree with you. It was kind of slow, uh, and but good in a good. I mean, it's a masterful thing. I don't feel like I wasn't it needed to be cut. I wasn't bored. But it felt long. At one point, you asked me what time it was, and I think only something like 25, 30 minutes had gone yeah. by, and I thought, oh my God, surely. <laughs> I know. It felt like an hour. Yeah, it, it really did. It, it, it's an hour and a half movie that feels like two and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the payoff is worth it. Uh, it's certainly different. Yeah. And again, it's so different because maybe we're, I guess we're kind of in this era now where horror movies don't 
really play it this straight anymore. Mm -mm. You don't get this straight out fairy tale. Yep, here's a family. Yep, they're terrorized by a witch. Yep, it's a witch. There's so much cleverness and Mm -hmm. trying to meta going on Mm -hmm. that this took me to a place that I've I've rarely spent much time in this puritanical... The closest thing... I don't know. I couldn't help but run through my mind the whole time I was watching this was uh, the, the Shyamalan film. Uh, the Village. The Village. Mm-hmm. And maybe of late, that is the only film I've seen that's... And that one really, truly isn't set in... Oops, right. Sorry. <laughs> spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler alert. In that time period. But when else have I seen a movie, a horror movie set in the puritanical time period like this that just played it so, mm-hmm. so straight? Uh, and really, the dialogue, which, again, as you said, at the end of the film, it said that mo- much of the dialogue, if not most of the dialogue, was taken straight from writings of the time. Mm-hmm. That was very impressive. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it seemed very authentic that way, too. It's a kind of movie that you feel a little smarter after. Yeah, I mean, it left. feels like historical fiction. Yeah. I mean, it, it really does seem to be rooted in history, although I choose to believe <laughs> that it's, it, the whole witchcraft thing is fictional. Well, you're not a member of the Church of Satan, no. that's what you're, it's what you're yeah. revealing to us. Oh, so that's a shame. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't give it an A+. Uh, like I said, I didn't really have any expectations going in. And I thought that it was pretty good, but I didn't love it. It wasn't gripping, was it? Yeah. It was gripping at moments. Mm -hmm. It was certainly intriguing and interesting. Yeah, and I think it was well executed. I I mean, I think it was well done. I don't know. It's just, maybe it was, maybe it was a little too slow for me. Um, There were definite highlights. I thought that the young lady who played Thomason did a very good job. I thought the acting overall was, was... Quite strong. I, I think that my favorites were um, Thomason and Caleb. Yeah. Um, they really seem to, uh, you know, embody their characters. None of them were bad. Like you said, the kids were cute and precocious, and the mom was a little over the top, but it, it didn't read like bad acting. It just read like character choice. The cinematography was different. Like you could tell they were going for a particular tone, and I think they got what they were going for. So it's not that I don't think that it's a well done movie, and it's not that I think that there won't be people out there who really like it. For example, I was reading that Stephen King said that this movie terrified him. <laughs> but Stephen King almost anything terrifies this guy. I mean, doesn't he sleep with a nightlight on? I, I, don't, know. Know. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I know what you mean. I wasn't terrified, but it was creepy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it's I think it's worth a viewing if you're a horror fan i i would say if for nothing else than the originality um i I'd, I'd give it a watch i concur well thank you again for listening to another podcast if you enjoyed this please share it with a friend check us out on facebook we're also on itunes and stitcher where you can subscribe to us leave us a note let us know what you thought of the of the show and give us some suggestions for other films to watch into the future until then i'm todd and i'm craig with two guys in a chainsaw